Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about my skill uh, in, a, in a dynamically uh, scaled environment. But to do this, I'm going to split my 30, 30 minutes into two sections. One is going to be blah, blah, talking, talking, slides, slides, and then a live demo, which is a bit more impressive. But uh, we'll need to do this as, as and I'll, do, I'll go quickly. I'm, I'm talking a bit quick, I know. I'll try to pace myself. Um, but I have a lot of stuff I want to show you. And to start up, we're going to start with what we called MySQL InnoDB cluster. This is a new product we announced about a year ago. Uh, it is not the cluster that um, you might know as NDB. It's a different cluster. This is um, supposed to fill up a gap in our product um, offering that we had. And the idea is fully synchronized, uh, or what we call virtually synchronized, a cluster built on top of MySQL servers. So it's not a distributed NDB that is a different cluster. Um, actually, NDB is, a, is much more advanced than this one, but not always you should or can use NDB clusters. So this one is the, uh, the one I'm going to show you. And the idea about um, this cluster is that it's built on top of regular machines. So you have your regular um, InnoDB MySQL machines. And they are connected between themselves with the new protocol that we call the X protocol. Sounds really exotic. Um, and the idea is that on commit, all the transaction will be committed to all the servers at once. Now, this cluster has two modes. One is multi-master, was, uh, was one called single primary. We actually prefer or recommend to use the single primary one, which is similar to the master-slave replication that you might heard of. But it's much better because it's synchronized. Uh, and it has the automatic failover, which I'm going to show you in the live demo very soon. Um, now, with the InnoDB cluster, it's actually a name that encapsulates uh, three different products. It's the InnoDB cluster, it's the MySQL router, and the shell. All of them together create the cluster. And this is what I'm going to show you in the live demo. But in order to get there, we need to talk about the new version we've got. And the new version is part of a, our way to go forward to improve MySQL as a database for developers and Python a, as well. And some places, when I go to Paycon, I'm doing lots of Paycons around the region, some places, they don't want to hear me because they think that Postgre is the best database ever. Um, <laughs> well, if you ask me, I'll say no. If you ask Postgre people, they'll say yes. Uh, but there are a few things that we used to say, OK, if you need to do this, then you need to go to Postgre. If it was transactional DDLs, if it was GIS, then yes, we didn't have the support. I'm happy to say that we do have a support, in some cases, better than what Postgre have for transactional DDLs, for um, GIS, and for other stuff that uh, we now support. So those are the main things that we have currently in our version. It's version 8. So the current version for MySQL is 8. Everything I'm going to show you is on version 8. GPL, free to use, open source, download, use it as much as you want. So it is mobile friendly, built mainly for mobile application. Developer first, we listen to our developers. We have good connection to the big companies in the world, the Facebook, the Twitters, all those guys, uh, Googles. They're all talking to us and saying, oh, well, you know, if you could do this, that would be awesome. And we're like, oh, you know what? Ah, let's do it. Um, data driven. Data is everywhere. We talk about it on every conference. All the talks are about the amount of data that we now have to process. So we, as the back end, have to give you the ability to process the data as easy as simple as possible. And obviously, being 24-7 all the time and being able to dynamically scale up and scale down, or mainly scale up, this is what we want. We want to scale. We want to go up. So quickly through the new features. One, transactional data dictionary. So we change our data dictionary. It's a, it's a, it's, it was in the pipeline for a long time. We wanted to change our data dictionary from files into a transactional data. And now we did. So our data dictionary is now no longer files, the FRM, if you know MySQL, no longer there. Now it's all happening in InnoDB. So it's all transactional and safe, and it's much better. And one of the uh, things that happen immediately, if you have big databases, with lots of tables. If you went to information schema, it was a pain, took a long time. Now um, it takes much, uh, much quicker because 
it's all coming from a database and not, doesn't need to go and scan FRM files. So it's a huge improvement that has um, lots of things in it. Cities, I know it's not a new thing. Cities are there in databases for a long time. It's new to us. We didn't have cities, and now we do. If you don't know what cities are, and you want to know more, come to me after and I'll explain. Uh, it actually, really, if, if you haven't used cities, it can change the way you access your data inside databases and make stuff much easier to write and to, uh, and to use. And it is also recursive, which is the difference. So cities, really quickly, is like writing a temporary table with a result set that then you can reuse in your query. But if you use cities, you don't need to create a table, you don't need to delete the table, and you can refer to different uh, tables um, or different cities from within themselves, and you can do it recursively. You can't see anything in there because the black is just awful, but that's a, uh, that's a demo or a, a short code how you count from one to 10 with a city. It's really annoying that you can't see anything. Uh, window functions. Window function, again, it's not a new thing, it's a new thing to us. A window function, and again, you can hardly see, but it's the over. The ability to, for each row, you can do calculation on a window that takes into account different rows that relate to this, to this uh, row. Now, uh, let's see, yes, I've got the next, which we're not going to see anything, but basically what you're supposed to see in here is a sales list that shows you different countries, different products. It's really, really annoying, this, this projector. Um, and then how much was the, um, or calculation of how much was the total sales, which is easy. It's like doing some on all of them. But then the next row is showing you per country. So it takes the country and then calculate for each row. The, again, you can see, so it doesn't mean much to you. But basically, window functions can take window and this window can be active so doing a running average or time or time series calculation all of them can be done with window functions so again new function this one is if you haven't heard about it i would suggest you go and google it it's quite amazing this is our view of you know what no sql is great but no sql by itself really suck it's not good it's a place you can drop all your stuff, but you can do analytics with. So we thought, oh, you know what? We have an SQL database, relational database. You can do all your SQL. It's great. But it doesn't have the no SQL abilities. Well, guess what? We do. What this thing allow, the, um, the, a, the hybrid API, allows you to access to the same data from an SQL interface and a brand new CRUD no SQL interface. We call it X the X uh, API, the hybrid API, and it allows you to access the data in the way you prefer. So the message here, without being too frontal about it, is that you don't need other NoSQL databases alongside to your relational database. You can use just one database. So you don't need Mongo <coughs> anymore. OK, now with the, with the ability of having a JSON data string, it's a new data format that we introduced about two years ago, not new anymore. And then the JSON functions and the API, all of them together, allows you to actually have a document store. But bear in mind, the data is still in the same place where you can access from the SQL. So it's the same tables. You don't need to do any synchronization, any load, any batching, nothing. The data is there. You can run. No SQL with CRUD operation, no JS, whatever you want, Python, whatever you want, and then do the same op or different operations with SQL and joins and analytics uh, with the same data, which is, oh, I've got this, which is actually, again, you can't see anything, but it shows the two different interfaces and the fact that they are basically sitting in the same tables. So, yeah. Next, this is the reason why I said that we are improving against our competitor databases. We used to have a really, really bad GIS um, support, geographical location uh, indexing. We had a really, really bad support to it. Uh, I won't explain exactly what we did, but we did a lot of improvement, and now we are actually better than most of the other databases in the ability to do GIS operations. 
UTF-8 is a default. Again, for us, people that develop for a, especially mobile, if you are interacting with people, if your application or your microservices need to, to interact with people, people love you, uh, anim, anim, uh, those icons, uh, emoji cons, emoji, emojis, okay? Sorry, took me a while to uh, get there. So people like those emojis, and I don't know why, but they do. So the, instead of sending a message, just send an emoji, and you're supposed to understand, what? I don't understand. What is face supposed to mean? Um, it does mean that it doesn't know what to write back. Anyway, so the problem was that uh, if you do emojis and you need to store them, especially with you guys from Thailand, the fact that you have a language is a bit different than English and the other you know, common languages in, the, in Europe, uh, you need to use a, a, a collation that allows you to save those uh, characters in, instead of converting them. So instead of you seeing them converting your special language signs or doing searches in your own language natively, or even put uh, emojis in your database and use them. Now with UTF-8, as a default, you can do it. The problem with UTF, historically, is that it's performance poor. The difference is that we now use MB4, which is multi-byte 4, that allows you to do, put those emojis and gain the performance. Um, I do have, in a different slide, graph that shows you that actually using the new variant MB4 actually is really, really quick and doesn't, uh, you don't have to sacrifice uh, usage. Better handling of hot rolls. Again, we, we had a talk right now about concurrency. Now, concurrency is a big thing now because we have all those microservices that interact with people in different times and we have high concurrency to our database. And that means that the database needs to somehow let you deal with those hotspots, and we had two things. You can't really see it, but this one says skip locked, and this one says no wait. And the idea is that you can instruct the optimizer to do one of two things. If we are querying and trying to change rows that are locked, by default, the server will wait for those locks to go. Now, if we're waiting and the lock takes a long time, then the uh, the client experience is actually quite poor. This allows you to do one of two things, saying, okay, those rows that are locked, just ignore them. Go, go ahead, give me whatever is not locked. It's enough for me. And the other one allows you to actually return an error immediately when uh, there are locks, and instead of waiting for the lock timeout. I'll give you an example where it works well. It works well when you have, for instance, a system to order uh, seats on a plane. Now you have this guy that is now has his page and he's choosing a seat and he's thinking, ah, oh, oh, this seat, no, this is too close to the toilet, no, this, oh, no, the, this will be. And you just want to book a seat. So you're coming in and because he's now locking his seat, you will have to wait. This is the, the traditional way. We don't want it. So if you do skip locks, it means that his seat will be not available for you. All the rest will be, which is good because I know exactly when I want to sit. I want to click and I want to go on. This is an example of where this thing works really well. Better optimizer, uh, which takes into account your hardware. Um, it's, um, it shows basically a very standard query that does a lot of joins. And it has two optional plans of running. I'll go quickly into the table. There are two plans that this can happen in. Now, depends on how much memory you've got on your server. One will take, if you have enough memory, it will actually take five or six seconds to complete on plan one, but if you don't have enough memory, this plan will take 10 minutes to complete. On the other hand, the other plan will work not as good when you have lots of memory, but really, really good if you don't have enough memory. And in this table, we see the, uh, we see the comparison between version 5.6, 5.7, the old version, and eight. 5.6 always takes version four, uh, plan four, 5.7, we tried to optimize it, and we got to plan A all the time. And now 8 can actually take the one that actually makes more sense. Depends on how much memory you've got. Uh, schema histograms, a nice way to see. You can't see anything, but it's a distribution of how, uh, how your executions for a specific uh, query uh, went through. 
you can see, so it doesn't make sense. Performing that performance uh, schema data logs, again, you can see the table, but it shows you what are the current active logs. It was missing from previous versions, so if you run a query and it's hanging out, you don't know why, you can see here what are the logs that are um, there. Descending indexes, the ability for you to say, okay, you know, I want to index on this, on this uh, column, and I know that most of the time I'm going to do this kind of order on this uh, column. You can tell the optimizer to build the indexes in such a way. In previous versions, you could specify it, it will ignore you. It will be there, ignore you, and do it always, always as descending, and now you can change it. Invisible indexes, the ability to create an index, and the index will be fully maintained and everything, but you are telling the optimizer to ignore it. It's there, but you can't use it. It's great because you can build an index, or you can have an index and decide, oh, I might not need this index, so I'm gonna delete it. If you delete it and you find out that you need it, you have to rebuild it, it can take a long time. Make it invisible means that you now can in in execute queries against this table without this index, check how it works, and if, oh, well, I need it, it was great, you just, in an instant, change it to visible and nothing happened, and if you don't, you can delete it. MySQL roles, okay, I just go quickly because you can't see all the stuff. Persistent configuration, it's great for the cloud. If you don't have access, you don't want to allow access to your DBAs and developers to the file system of the database, you can now set parameters, uh, runtime parameters from inside MySQL and make them persist between restarts. Even though the configuration file will say one thing, if you set a persistent, it will uh, stay there. This is a, an important stuff if you do, uh, if you use UUIDs and you should use UUIDs instead of running incrementals. Now UUIDs is a great way to make sure that you have no conflicts. The big problem with UID is that they are great for people to read because they have these dashes and stuff. They are awful for computers. So we have now functions that can change and convert them into a way that computers actually understand and um, can store much quicker. And now the live demo. Okay, so in the live demo, I'm actually gonna show you. I've got a machine here in white. I'm not used to white. Now I already set up five machines five different MySQL machines. Currently, they're running on the same virtual machine, but in, in reality, they're supposed to run on different machines with different IPs. Mine are running on different ports, just to save my laptop from dying from five different machines, but it's the same for, um, for different machines, and they are already set up with a cluster. I just saved some time. It took me about five minutes over there, so if you want me to see it, I can show you how I'm, I'm doing it very quickly. I just saved some time. So the five machines are running, and on three of them, we have a cluster, right? And on top of this cluster, I'm gonna run an application. It's a PHP application with JavaScript that you'll see in a second in browser. And there is a Python worker uh, around it, uh, behind it, that just add transactions as we go, okay? So let me just get rid of this, wait. You go, go, okay. So we have this in here. Let me see if I can get myself in here. Okay, oh, I can't see anything. Let's see if I'm lucky. Yep, I'm lucky. So that's the application. We have the five different machines, different ports. You barely can see because it's black. And then this is where the application is. And I'm gonna start the router. So the application is now waiting for the router to start up. Okay, so I'm gonna start up the router. Take this, run in here and our application is start running. So we have this kind of like, you know, the worker is now going and it creates different transactions that come from different countries. And we see here the rights. This is a single primary mode. As I said, the cluster can be in multi-master. So you'll have read and writes from all of them. But this is the recommended setting. Why? Come to me and explain why and how you can use them and what the difference between them. And then we have some analytics of on which country is sending most of the money, right? So this is all running now, and this is our application, and we want this thing to run all the time. Not fail, because it's money. We get money, you see we already have about 200,000 bucks. Good. So we have rights on this server, 
and reads on those two servers, they are, they are, um, they are split. Now, my application, my PHP application knows nothing about the cluster. It is connecting through a router, so the application has one point of connection, and the router does the splits. Now, not read and write splits. We are not there yet, so my application knows how to split read and writes, but that's the only thing. But it just goes to one, um, to one, uh, I, to one IP and port for writes, and one, P, one IP and ports for reads. Okay, now, this application really became very, very um, attractive for people, and we need to add more servers. So we're gonna add those into the party, into the cluster. So now, currently, there are just empty MySQL machines. Right, there's, there's nothing in there, so let's do it, okay. And we're gonna use, now I need to, oh, got this, Rockstar. Ah, look at me, I feel like Elton John. Right, okay, so the first, ooh, the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna connect to a MySQL shell, which I told you it's three different uh, things inside or creating the uh, InnoDB cluster. The cluster, the, you know, the, the, the group application, which is what replicates stuff between those machines, router that split the read and write, and shell to administer the whole thing. So shell is an administrative tool. This is the one, I'll make it really, really big. Here you go. This shell can speak currently JavaScript, Python, it is written in Python, and SQL, okay? So now we are in, JS in JavaScript notation, which is the default, and we're gonna create an empty, an empty password for this. Uh, yeah, right, over there, yeah, okay. And where is my mouse? Can you see it? Oh, here you go. And I'm gonna connect to my primary server. Okay, so I just connected to my primary server, and now, as you can see, I'm, I'm connected with SSL to my main server. And I'm gonna create an object which is the cluster. It's just an object, and then we have methods on it. And we're adding instance, okay? So I'm adding the instance, and here you go, this is the pod that we're gonna add. So remember here, we have this machine, it runs on, can I show you, where is it? Uh, uh, da, 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 here. Okay, so it's 3340. Okay, so let's add this machine. If I can find my mouse, where is it? Where are you? Here you go. Okay, it's as easy as this. Just adding the instance and currently nothing happens. You'll see a bit of reads there, but that's because now it is entering into the cluster. But if, we'll, if we look at the, the status, you will see it's now recovering. So currently, it is joining. Currently, it is joining the cluster, but it is still recovering because it doesn't have the data. It needs to go into one of those and say, oh, can you give me everything you've got because it needs to be uh, consistent. So it does no reads and writes for the application, but the application keeps on running. Nothing happens at all. We'll wait until this comes in, and it will take time because my laptop is really, really bad. I've got a new laptop at home that I need to set up, but it, was, it came too late for the conference, so my laptop uh, needs to go to the place where laptops are not coming back from. We will have to wait. There is nothing I can do about it. Come on, join us. Yeah, come on. And when it's done, the router automatically goes into the cluster and read the metadata again and find out that there is a new server in town. And the server will join automatically if we're lucky, if I'm lucky. Come on, join. Now, in my demo, I've got another server, I think the other server as well, but I prefer to show you a disaster. So we'll let this finish and then I'll show you what happens with a disaster because I think my time is about to finish very soon. You know what, let me just, because really, this is, this is unfortunately, my laptop is really, really bad. Um, it's SSD and everything, but it's just, it had its life, and I'm running those demos all the time. I think my laptop said, enough. It's enough. You know, so I'll stop for a second just the stream, so the walker will stop 
hammering with. Well, what happens now is that this is adding more and more transactions. This is trying to catch up, but you know, it's so, this comes so quick, so it doesn't catch up. I'll stop the, the stream for a second, just for this server to catch up. You'll have to believe me that it's actually happening in the, in the background, it will happen as well. Let's see, let's see. Yeah, are you recovered, are you done yet? Oh no, oh. You don't need this. Online, yeah. See, as soon as we stopped the stream, it came up. Here you go. So this was supposed to happen in the background. Sorry guys for my laptop being so weird, but now you can see that the load went a bit lower than what it was before, because now it's split between three machines. Now, in reality, my laptop is just now have another machine to hammer, so it's like, ah. Great. Now I'll do a disaster. Instead of adding the other one, to add another one is just adding another one. I, I, I wanted five because I wanted to remember, and please remember if you are using this, the number of servers is always an, an odd number, never even. Okay? Never a, a multiplier of two. Always not a multiplier of two. The reason is because we have in this cluster, we have two things that need to be always. One is Chrome. So all of them all of them decide anonymously on each transaction. And the other thing is majority. If we have a split in the middle right now, we will have a problem because there is no majority. There is no side that says more servers than the other. Now, this is a situation that's called split brain or a possibility for split brain because none of the sides know which is the one that is actually the one that's supposed to provide information. And in this case, all of them will go into a read-only mode, right? So if we have five servers, so it's three, five, seven, or nine, this is the maximum amount of servers right now. Never mind where we split it, we always have side that has more servers than the other. This is why I wanted five, because it's a best practice. But I'm not gonna wait for another one to go in. Let's do a disaster. Now there was disaster that can happen. If, if one of those die, we don't care. Ah, well, we have another. The worst disaster we can have is when this one is shutting down, right? So let's do it. Let's shut it down. Okay, uh, yep, this one and this one. Uh, where is my mouse? There you go. Okay, so I'm gonna just go out of here, go into the MySQL shell again and I am going to run a stop for the first server. I'm going to do it. Wait, I'll do it this way because I need to switch immediately. And, oh, so wait, possible, yeah, okay, okay. So we had, this one is died. Now look, the application is now waiting for a second. This is because my laptop suck. But in reality, it takes really a very short amount of time. This server went down and there was a new election of a new primary. Now I didn't have to do anything. It's all happening in InnoDB cluster. You don't have to do anything. Immediately there is a new primary in town. This was promoted as a primary and down those are adjusted to have this as a primary. And it was automatic failover. We didn't lose anything. The application is still running and this is scalability online. Uh, if, I, if I'm bringing this up, it will just you know, recover, catch up and it won't become the primary again. So don't expect to have a fail back kind of thing because there is no meaning of any of them. It's just happened to be this one the first and this one the second, but they are all supposed to be the same. So that was my 30 minutes talk that is now actually 45 questions. Oh, on Good question. Is this feature available in the free version? The answer is yes. Everything I showed you all the features, everything inside uh, what I've showed you is in the free version, it's not part of the paid version. Paid version has different stuff in it. Oh, not different stuff, it's add-ons. We don't, so um, we had the, the keynote. So the keynote that we had about open source and corporate-led uh, projects, I, I just wanted to pick up my hand and say, yes, we are a corporate um, led uh, open source. So we are actually an open source product that is owned by a corporate, but Oracle. Um, and we do have a paid version. 
the way, and people ask me, okay, so you know, why buying something I can get for free? Or how do you make money? You're giving your stuff for free. And that's, that's, the, that's the problem with open source. It's quite hard to make money from stuff that you actually give for free. And we keep give our stuff for free. We'll keep give our stuff for free forever. We can't change it because it doesn't make sense. If we stop, if we close the source, and we can. We can tomorrow close the source, Oracle, not me. I, I can do anything. I'm just working for Oracle. But Oracle can actually tomorrow close the source and not give MySQL anymore for free. But everything that was um, distributed until then is still GPL. It means that everyone can pick up the GPL and keep on going in a free version. There's nothing that Oracle can do against it. So Oracle is not going to close up MySQL. It doesn't make sense. We invest so much money. Why would we? Most of our users are the GPL free version people. Uh, the enterprise version is version that had, has more add-ins that make it an enterprise ready. So you've got all this, and you've got some more stuff. If you want to hear more, just come to me and I'll explain what are the add-ons. And it is mainly for big enterprises, big companies, uh, for most of us that are doing startups or small stuff or um, you know stuff that is still not uh, profitable enough. The free version is as good as the enterprise version. There is nothing. Uh, that there is no reason for you to come and buy MySQL or to think, oh, that will be closed or whatever. We are not. So everything I showed you, including this, is all in the free version. More questions about, yeah. So when you're comments, so if I have a column, add a column to the table, based on my screen, is there any sort of sharding of stuff, or how does memory scaling do this work? And if I want to do a calculation that runs across more rows that will fit in memory line, do you have a line that you can use in this, or is it a share, or is it a work? OK, so, so the question was uh, with the Mongo or the no SQL interface that we have yet. Uh, what happens when you have a big amount of all the big chunks of data that you put in? So first of all, if you are talking about huge blobs, um, blobs are never a great thing for us, uh, for databases as a whole. Uh, we don't like them, um, unless, unless it's a really data that you can actually uh, somehow analyze, uh, like, you know, people tend to put pictures and stuff. This is not where we are. Um, so that's, that's where you go to the Hadoop type of things, and then you have MapReduce and all the other stuff, and Splunk to do it. Um, but with sharding, again, not necessarily with big information, sharding can be achieved with MySQL NDB cluster. So NDB cluster shard on, on, different, um, on different nodes and can do multiple processing and, and parallel processing. There is another thing that I can't really talk about. It's still confidential uh, that will take care of this kind of stuff. Can't talk about it, sorry. I, <coughs> I can mention we have it, but I can't say what it is. We are working um, to do something similar to what you asked. Uh, <coughs> that's it. My, my laptop just died. No, come back, don't die, uh, yet, <laughs> until I have the new one. Um, yes, yeah, so um, it really depends on, so we don't shard across, in, with this we, don't, we are not sharding yet. Processing that is too big to your memory, for your memory, uh, depends on what type of things you're doing. If, it's a, if it needs to create a temporary table and it's too big, it will just go on disk. Performance will go down, but you will have disks, so we manage this by, so depends on exactly what you, you're after, but yeah, so it's not, uh, you know, I won't, I won't stand here and lie and be a corporate guy that says, oh, we just better than MongoDB and everything. No, we just think that we are giving a good run for the money for the MongoDB stuff, and the big thing is that you don't need to hold, you don't have to have different databases, which is what we see in the, what we see in the market, in, the, in our clients, in our users, is that they use MySQL because they think it's great and it's popular and everyone wants it, great, blah, blah, blah. But then they have MongoDB and they have this and that and Hadoop and, and lots of lots of uh, environments and it becomes just too big to manage. So we are trying to say, you know, think if you really need the NoSQL databases, 
not the Hadoop. We can replace Hadoop. No, we're not trying. It's not, it's not our area. But we can do the noise scale, we can do the GIS uh, quite well. So we can take this under our umbrella. If, if we are good enough, then, you know, why not? More questions? Come on, don't be tired. Just ask questions. Any more questions? I think it's, they, they want to go to lunch. Uh, I wonder about... Do, we, can we share the logic behind selecting which one is a primary server? Uh, the first one you'll, you'll add to the cluster will be the primary at the beginning. But then when there is a disaster, yeah. you, don't have the, you're not, you don't have a way to choose. It's an internal process. They all basically come up and say, okay, this is how um, updated I am. If they're all updated and it's supposed to be the same on the same state, then I think the next one will be chose. Not, not necessarily, so you have no way to say. Okay. <laughs> but the idea is again, you have to remember that those machines are supposed to be as equal, completely equal. Don't you know, put one that is really, really strong and all the others, just you know, the, 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 the machine that you took from the secretary desk and put there, uh, which is sometimes we get it because, just and remember another thing, <coughs> sorry, remember another thing, this is not right scalable. It's only read scalable. Because every write that comes to each of those servers, even in multi-master, so people are saying, ah, oh, multi-master will have a, you know, sh a, a scaling in write. No, you won't. Because every write has to go to all of them. They're all holding the old, the old replica of the old data. This is different than MySQL cluster, NDB, which is, which is sharding, and then you do have write scaling. In this, we don't. The future, we're supposed to have a system that allows you to do automatic sharding, and then you'll have different one of those, so you'll have a replicate of this to another one that is a different shard. But that's still in the future, in the roadmap. It will happen at 20, 35, whatever, when we get to it. Uh, it's supposed to be at the one, 2020, we're supposed to have out-of-the-box sharding, but that's out of my hands, fortunately.